Hi, everyone. Anthony Morganti here. Recently, I received an email from someone asking me about HDR in Lightroom. Instead of typing out my answer, I thought instead that I would refer them to the video that I did on it. So I went over to YouTube and I looked up that video. That's when I realized that the last video I did on HDR in Lightroom is seven years old. Lightroom has changed quite a bit over the past seven years. So today, I thought I'd do this updated video demonstrating how to do HDR in Lightroom, but I'm going to add just a little bit of a twist. What if you have images that need to have noise reduced? Is it better to reduce the noise on each of the images first, then take the resultant images that have the noise reduced, and merge those into your HDR image, or preferably, because it would be faster, just merge the images you have into an HDR image, then reduce the noise on it. Well, I tried it both ways, and I found that it doesn't matter. I get the exact same results. So in today's video, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about, and I'm going to give you some tips along the way that will help you get the best HDR merge possible. And for this demonstration, I have three different images of St. Joseph's Cathedral in Buffalo. And if I zoom in a little bit, you'll notice that there is a considerable amount of noise in each of the bracketed shots. You'll also notice that as I click through the images that it's moving a little bit. And the reason for that is I did not use a tripod, but that's okay because with Lightroom, we could automatically align the images. Now, unfortunately, when I did do this bracket, I did not go low enough, meaning I didn't take a dark enough image because the right-hand stained glass windows are still blown out. I was trying to avoid that. That's why I did the bracket, but I didn't do a good enough job. But we're going to do this HDR image nonetheless. Now, as I mentioned, you do not have to go to the Detail tab and click the noise on each of the three first. We're just going to immediately merge these into HDR. Also, you'll notice that no editing has been done to any of these RAW files at all. And that's what I recommend you do. Don't do any editing to the raw files. Don't waste your time. Save all your editing for the resultant image that you get. So I have the three images. They're not edited at all. I clicked on the first one in the film strip. I'm going to hold the shift key down, click on the last one so they're all selected. I'm going to go up to photo, down to photo merge, and then over to HDR. And when you do that, you'll get the HDR dialog box. And there's a lot of options here. The first option is auto align. Obviously, I need to check that because I did not use a tripod. But even if I use the tripod, I would check that because there are often some micro movements of the tripod and it needs to be aligned. So it doesn't hurt anything. It just takes slightly longer to do the merge. So I'm always going to check that box no matter what. The next option is auto settings. And all that is, is in the basic tab, there's a button for auto where instead of editing the image manually, you just click the auto button and it will automatically edit the image. If you check this, when you're done, it's going to click that button for you. That's all it does. If I uncheck the checkbox, you could see that the preview shows the unedited image and there's the edited image. Now, typically I wouldn't check this because it just is a waste of time for me because I prefer to edit it myself. But for this demonstration, I'm going to check it just so you could see what it looks like when I'm talking about. Then you have deghost amount. This is if you have movement in the scene. So if this were outside and the treetops were like blown in the breeze a little bit, well, uh, those would ghost when you merge the images. So for something like that, you'd probably want a low deghost amount. On the other hand, if it was a little windier, you might want medium. Then, if it was really windy or maybe someone was walking through the scene along a path, you might want high. That will really take care of the deghosting. And if you want to see exactly what it's going to deghost, is if you have one of these buttons other than none checked in, you can click show deghost overlay. And it's just going to put a little red overlay over the parts of the image in the scene that it's going to apply the deghosting to. Now, Again, for this shot, I don't need to have any deghost amount checked. I'm going to keep it on none because I was in this cathedral all by myself. Nobody was moving. Obviously, it's indoors. I don't have to worry about any movement in the scene. So I'm going to keep that off. Uh, the last option you have is to create a stack. I don't like stacks. Stacks in Lightroom is when you have a number of the same images um, or similar images. And it will just stack them all together into a single stack. And it will have a number. In this case, once it would stack them, it would have the number four. Meaning there's four images stacked together. 
I don't like sticks, so I'm not going to chuck that. I'm just going to click merge. And we're going to merge it. And then once it merges, I'll have a raw file. It's going to give me a DNG file. And some of you might be worried that you won't be able to do denoise on that DNG file because in Lightroom, historically, if you send a manufacturer raw file, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, whatever, doesn't matter. If you send it off to an external application, maybe to get it enlarged or to do something with it, and it comes back as a DNG file, you won't be able to do the noise reduction to it because it comes back as what's called a linear DNG file. All the information that was in the original raw file that allows denoise to work has been stripped away. Well, when you do HDR inside a Lightroom, it doesn't strip away that info. So you're still able to use the AI noise reduction built into Lightroom. For example, I'll click on our resultant DNG file. You can see it says HDR.DNG. You'll also notice that the basic tab has, you know, it's the light ball or the little eyeball is lit. That means editing has been done. That's because I had the auto option checked. I'll get back to that in a minute. It also, also did lens corrections. To jump to the chase, if I go to the detail tab, you can see the denoise option is still there. So that's still available and I can do it. One other thing before I do denoise to it, you'll also notice that there's a little like dot underneath the crop. Uh, did it crop it? Well, it did in a way. What happened was because I had auto align checked, uh, because these were handheld as well, it had to align them and there's some dead pixels around the edges that it had to crop away. If it was perfectly on a tripod, or if I didn't have that option checked, then it wouldn't have automatically cropped away the dead pixels. So that's why the crop tool has the little dot under it. But first of all, I mentioned that I don't like to use auto adjustments. So if I go to the basic tab, you'll see the auto button is grayed out. It applied the auto adjustments and I just can't undo it by clicking on the auto button. So if you accidentally had that checkbox checked and you want to uncheck it, what you can do is just double click. You'll notice that, first of all, that auto, all auto does is it adjusts some sliders in the tone. In this case, it adjusted all six of the sliders and it will adjust vibrance and or saturation. In this case, it adjusted both slightly. What you could do to reset them is just double click on the word tone to reset those six sliders, then double click on the word presence to result reset those sliders. Now we're right back to an unedited raw file. Oh, uh, well, slightly edited raw file. It did do crop away the blank pixels and it did do lens corrections. But we're going to go to the detail tab and we're going to click on denoise. And then you'll get the denoise dialog box. And typically what I'll do is I'll click on this minus magnifier to zoom out. Then I'll click on an area like right there where I know there was a lot of noise. And then I'll put this slider at 50. I like to start right in the middle and then I'll look at, and did it reduce noise? Yeah, it does look pretty good. Then I'll drag it around and I could still see kind of in the darker areas. I don't know if it's coming through on the resolution of the video, but there are, there is some noise in the darker areas. So what I'll do is I'll move this up to like 75. So I'm kind of splitting the difference between 50 and 100. Then I'll look at it and I'll drag it around. And uh, well, I don't see any noise at all. So I was at 50, I went to 75. So I kind of split the difference again. I'll go somewhere in the 63 area there, 60, 61. That actually looks pretty good as well. I'll just pull it down a little bit between 50 and 63, you know, 57. That looks good. And for this demonstration, let's say 57 was good. So I like that. I'm going to click enhance. Now, it's going to give us a fifth file, all right? So, um, you know, that's just kind of the nature of the beast. We're going to have a lot of different files now. We're going to have two different DNGs. We're going to have this one that says HDR.DNG. And this, when it's done doing this noise reduction, it's going to have an enhanced.HDR.DNG. And it's going to take a little while to do. So I'll pause the video and then we'll come back when it's done. Okay, it's back, and you can see that it has HDR da dot dash enhanced da dash noise reduction. So it has noise reduction done to it. This is the other um, DNG file that we got back from the HDR operation that we did. So we want to do all our work to this one. What you may want to do is give it a pick flag or something so that you know it's the actually last image that you'll be doing. So when you're exporting your 
you could easily find it. Now, what I typically do uh, then is for my editing, um, I'll after I do noise reduction, is I'll crop if needed. I don't really want to crop this, but it is crooked, so I want to straighten it. And the way I like to straighten is I'll open up the crop tool and I'll come off the image either to the left or to the right. And if I just come off the image a little bit, I'll get this kind of double arrow. And if I click, you'll notice we get a tight grid. And what I'm looking at is the pipe organ in the distance here. It has these verticals that should be perfectly vertical. So I'm just going to make sure that I crop it or I actually pull down so that I'm straightening it so those verticals look to be perfectly vertical. As I'm doing that, I'm also noticing that the center line is off a little bit. I tried to stand right in the middle and shoot straight ahead so that I could get a, like a perfectly symmetrical shot. But you'll notice that I didn't. The center line is off to the right a little bit, so I need to pull in from the right-hand side. Um, I kind of like the top. I, like, I don't want to crop away anything from the ceiling, so I'm going to go to the bottom right-hand corner and just pull in a little bit. Then again, click and see what I did. I didn't pull in enough, it looks like, so do it a little more. Or I pulled in too much, I'm sorry. Pull back out a little bit. And see, yeah, that looks pretty good right there. Just double click. I'm pretty vertical. I'm happy with that. We'll close the crop tool. Now, another concern you may have is when you often, often, if you don't have the manufacturer raw file, you'll lose your manufacturer camera profiles. You don't when you do this. Uh, for example, if I go to the basic tab and I go to the profile browser, you see camera matching are still here. Often, as I mentioned, if you take your you know manufacturer raw file and you send it off to an external amp, you come back with the DNG, it's going to strip away the camera matching profiles. Well, they're still here, so I could choose a profile. Another concern you may have is often when you use a third party to do some editing, you come back with that DNG, that linear DNG, um, your white balance will no longer be in the Kelvin scale. It will just be in a range of minus 100 to 100. And you often could get a better white balance adjustment with the Kelvin scale. And you can see I have the full Kelvin scale here. Also, if I go to the drop down, you can see that all those options are available as well. Quite often, again, when you send an image off and you come back with that linear DNG, you're going to lose all these options as well. So it's really a real raw file. We could do work on it as we would. And to continue with my editing, I'm going to come in and pull the highlights down, open up the shadows. I'm going to get a white point by holding in the option key on my Mac. It's Alt key on the PC. Click, and you'll notice I am already blowing out those highlights over there in those windows. I'll pull that down. The blacks, I'll pull this this way. I make it a little darker than I probably want it. So just hold that in. I'm probably going to have to blow out those windows a little bit. I didn't do a very good job on my bracket. Um, you know, obviously I wanted to make sure that I preserved uh, detail in these windows on the right because the sun was over on that side and I didn't want to blow those out. So that's why I bracketed images. And obviously I didn't do a very good job. But I digress. It's good enough for this video. So we're going to add some clarity. We'll add some texture. I'm going to add some vibrance. I usually don't add vibrance and saturation. I'll add one or the other. And you can see what saturation is immediately making the browns look too brown. So I'm just going to move the uh, vibrance to the right like that. So I think that looks pretty good. And I'm just going to finish it off with a darker vignette. Just like that. Like that. And there is our resultant HDR image. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. Talk to you guys soon.